the NPC meme is the same thing for visual entertainment. It's just it's it's the ultimate peak art form. It, it it's just it's just pure you know endless you know visual and, and emotional stimulation. Uh, you know it, it it can go forever. It never needs to change. Like this is it. Like we you know we've done it. Hee haw yes, you got me feeling like a cowgirl. Let me run it, huh? Hee haw yes, you got me feeling like a cowgirl. Let me run it, huh? A lot of AI doomerism, I kind of view as it's sort of inspired by sort of uh, fascist nightmares. Right, which is it's, it's this idea of kind of these, you know, it's the Terminator idea. It's the it's the gleaming, you know, it's the it's it's the single minded pursuit of misery and death, exterminate all humans, you know, in the Terminator movies. There's another kind of apocalyptic cult you could imagine, right, or another theory of the end of the world, which is basically the machines that love us to death, right? <laughs> and you know, you get a little bit of this with the, like the the fear of like wireheading, right, or like the Wall-E scenario, right, of like we're just going to be you know brains in a vat, you know, we're just going to be have our you know headsets strapped to our face, and we're going to get fed you know the liquid food, and we're going to be you know in a, in in this sort of you know kind of you know VR you know wrap you know this the, that that form of dystopianism, um, and you know the, 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 this is actually one of the forms of the paperclip argument. The, the Doomers do talk about this a little bit. They talk, this is one of the forms of the paperclip argument, right? Which is what about the machine that's stalled to optimize human happiness, and what it just does is it straps us into the pod and feeds us bugs and you know stimulates our you know <laughs> it stimulates our orgasmic function for the next billion years right like <laughs> pinky doll so pinky, pinky doll, doll. Okay. <laughs> pinky doll. Pinky doll. <laughs> it all comes back to full circle mark welcome back to moment of zen thank you for for returning thank you great to be here we're going to get into some great uh intellectual heady topics today but first i thought we would talk about what's most important um in the world right now, which is Dan, can you please explain the NPC meme and wh why it's so significant? You want me ice to cream. explain or, or Mark to explain? <laughs> I, ice cream's so uh, good. Mm, ice cream's so good. Yes, maybe tee it up for him, Dan. <laughs> yes, well, yes. I, I think um, <laughs> this meme took the internet by storm, and I think we all have an opinion on, on why it um, has become so popular and resonated so much. Um, but I, I find it fascinating that, you know, kind of the only fans to TikTok uh, star pipeline, it, it seems like it's pretty real because, you know, we started with Pinky Doll, but then everyone else came out of the woodwork. I saw like a Victorian NPC today, you know, uh, you know, they had like cholera and, and a few other things that you could kind of pay them to <laughs> pretend to be, what? Um, you know, every, every fetish and subgenre is now available via TikTok. Um, I, I saw a reply to P the original Pinky Dot tweet that said, you know, handing out um, smallpox blankets might have been a more, um, you know, humane weapon of warfare than TikTok <laughs> if this is what it's causing to the culture. <laughs> Antonio, you, you said that her French was was exquisite. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, she, she speaks. I, I believe she's French Canadian and she doesn't have that, Quebe that Quebecois accent. Um, she so. So does everyone know what we're talking about, by the way? Does every, is, has it just everybody, so suffused? We don't need to yes. explain Pinky Doll. Okay, okay. Everybody yeah. knows. That's the whole, that's the whole point. <laughs> Why is this a brilliant form of creativity instead of a dystopian housecape? Well, it's just, it's the perfect... Okay, so my, my thesis, my thesis is that the NPC, NPC TikToks are the, 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 the peak pinnacle of human creative achievement. They're the best, what? They're the best we've ever had it. I, I, I would argue so far that they're the, the perfection of the form of human generated entertainment, uh, you know, which is great because we've, we've reached perfection right before the AIs take over. Um, so, you know, just in time. Um, and the reason it's so perfect, I mean, one is you just watch it, obviously it's perfect. So like, you know, you don't really need to explain it. it, it you know, it, it, it resonates with you kind of, you know, naturally, but, um, but no, the, 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 rash, the, the logical argument for why it's, it's the ultimate perfected form of entertainment. It's the, it's the alien xenomorph of, of entertainment uh, is how I, I would put it. It's per perfectly evolved. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because like, look, human generated entertainment has gone through an evolutionary process. Like everything else it has gone through natural selection. You know, you started out with, you know, epic poetry, you know, you started Homer and, you know, the, the plays of, of, uh, the Greeks and, you know, sort of this incredibly like highbrow stuff, you know, classical music, um, you know, incredible, you know, stage plays, like all this, you know, novels, Don Quixote, all this incredibly sophisticated stuff. Um, and then over the course of hundreds of years, it's all gone through an evolutionary process, a process of selection that sort of has stripped away all of the inessential components, right? So it's, it's stripped away all, you know, stripped away all plot, it's stripped away all characters, it's stripped away all, you know, you know, scenery, it's stripped away, you know, it's just like what's happened in music, right? Music, everything has been stripped away in music other than just like grunts and moans. 
Right. And so, and, and so the NPC meme is the same thing for visual entertainment. It's just, it's, it's the ultimate peak art form. It, it, it's just, it's just pure, you know, endless, you know, visual and, and emotional stimulation. Uh, you know, it, it, it can go forever. It never needs to change. Like this is it. Like, we, you know, we've done it. And so just, just one point on that, Mark, I, I will confess when the pinky doll thing hit, we actually put it on the big screen in the office and we totally got sucked into feeding her ice cream and the cowboy hat. And it was like of the course. most, mes it was the most mesmerizing experience. <laughs> and I don't know how much money we spent cause it's in like the funny money, but we were just sitting there putting money into the slot machine, like some old boomer in a Vegas casino. It just never ended. <laughs> and we eventually had to like snap ourselves out of it. We we're like going crazy, but it, it, yeah, it was captivating. Well, what you don't know that I know is that you you told me you were going to do this three weeks ago, and then you went dark for two and a half weeks. So, <laughs> I, I think you need to check and see like what 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 month and day it actually is, because I, th I think you have some lost time. <laughs> oh, another uh, topic. I mean, how I do you get beat it? To... How do you beat it? Like, where does it go from here? What? How can it possibly be improved? Like, this is it. Like, she's done it. It's done. It's over. From here I, I on think out. it's Neuralink or bust at this point. Just, exactly, just right exactly. into the brainstem. Exactly, 100%. <laughs> the, um, we're going to talk about um, elites in a imagine, bit. And imagine if a... you could, by the way, being a Hollywood screenwriter on strike right now. <laughs> <laughs> with, with pinky doll sweeping the world. <laughs> Nick, um, what's your first thought? You know, you wake up in the morning and it's like, you know, you're kind of swimming in a consciousness and then you remember like the most important thing happened in the world. Right. And in this case, if you're a Hollywood screener, you're like, oh, shit, I'm on strike while Pinky Doll is taking everything over. <laughs> imagine Pink, imagine Pinky Doll on the Apple VR headset. Can you imagine just having Exa Pinky Doll straight exactly. into your eyeballs? Every, every new hardware platform needs a killer app. Apple has found it. <laughs> the, um, okay. I want to get into your, your, your AI uh, piece, Mark. Um, one response, you had a number of great podcasts. We're trying to ask di different questions here. W one response I heard someone ask was th this question of you're so excited about how AI will lead to all these amazing things, but you also wrote about in your recent fighting post, which is a great post on your Substack, that the world is going to be increasingly, uh, violent and uncertain. H how do you reconcile the, both the, the doomer optimist, um, sort of, uh, you know, tendencies there? Oh, well, so the, the, the increasing violence is purely a function of choice, right? Like the, the cities are not getting more violent because they have to get more violent. They're getting violent because we've decided we want them to get more violent, right? So, to, to, so in my mind, like, and we know exactly how to make them less violent, right? And of course, the, you know, that's the thing that we're, we're choosing not to do. You know, look, the, the same thing is obviously true at the level of countries, you know, and you, you can see it playing out in, in Central America right now with, uh, you know, the contrast between El Salvador and, and the other countries. Um, and so, it, like, look, that, that level of sort of physical, social, you know, violence risk you know, street level, you know, risk, danger, collapse, you know, sort of societal, you know, kind of normal collapse like that, that, you know, that, that clearly is a choice. Um, by, by the way, right, ironically, a solution to street level violence is technology, right? Um, and so, you know, there are these, there are these companies, I, I won't, you know, name names, but some of them are involved in, um, you know, that sell directly into the market of, you know, basically technology replacing law enforcement, you know, because if we're not going to have law enforcement anyway, then we might as well have technology to solve crimes. Uh, and keep people safe. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, we, yeah, I mean, there is just that, that, that's just a function purely of, of kind of getting what we want. Um, I, I think the AI topic is, is mostly uncoupled from that, uh, just in the sense of, you know, the AI topic is about inventing something new and figuring out new ways to use it, which is, you know, uh, which is a, yeah, just a, a, a orthogonal topic. And so just on that topic, the first one for a second, no one would consciously say that they are choosing this. And so are they all in denial sure, or but, what is sort of the, Theory of mind, I guess, no. behind that choice. <laughs> of course they would. Like it's happening. It's happening in play. Of course they're choosing it. But they wouldn't say that they're choosing it, right? Like if if Dustin Moskovitz was here, or anyone who is funding the the Chessa stuff, or um, like that's not what they would say they're choosing. Right? Like in their minds, they think that something different is happening, right? <laughs> I don't know. Has Dust, you know, has Dustin changed his philanthropic program? <laughs> like when when I talk when I talk to the people who are behind the, the 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 policies that have resulted in this orgy of violence, they they all seem they all seem totally fine with it. I, I have not yet talked to one of them that has a problem with it. So I you know I don't know what you call what, what you call that. I don't know if you call that a desired result or what it is. Um, the the other can, the other strategy, to Eric, is you stop measuring the statistics, right? Because <laughs> like you know if if you get rid of the statistics because the statistics are racist, then you you actually don't have that problem. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> but what, one thing in your piece, Mark, which I, th I thought was interesting, it, there's a, there's an ambiguity, right? Are you saying that the, the fighting should exist because 
it's a tactical necessity because law and order is breaking down. Part of what your piece was saying seemed to, to say that there's actually a virtue in violence or in preparing for violence. And that e even, even if we, and by the way, I think it's, one of the questions I've always had is like, why do we still have street crime? Everyone has like a network computer with a high quality camera. Like it shouldn't be possible to mug anybody anymore. But yeah, that's a, that's a side thing. I'm guessing that's what these companies are basically trying to do. But e even assuming we solve that problem such that there isn't street crime, you're saying that there's actual there's an actual virtue in preparing for violence anyhow, right? Yeah, so the, the question I was asked, I was at this conference and the, the question I was asked was, so <laughs> I was not asked the question, should Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk become Batman and Robin? You know, it's like they say, you know, San Francisco has so many fit billionaires, yet no Batman, right? <laughs> yes, <thank you. laughs> so, so, so anyway, that, that's not the question I was asked. You know, the question I was asked was, you know, what, what about the idea of both? It was actually, what about the idea of both of doing what Mark is doing, which is training for MMA, right? Which, he, which he's been doing, obviously, very publicly, very visibly, uh, and, you know, with obviously great, visibly great results. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then this related question of whether Mark and Elon should have the, you know, have the fights that they've been, you know, they've been talking about having. Um, you know, that, that obviously that's, that's not, you know, that's not that to me, that's not obviously a question around the street level violence or real world violence. That's a to your point, like that's a that's a virtue question um, and, a, and an aesthetics question. Um, and, that, and that's why I went straight to the Greeks. Right. Which is like it, it has all, you know, it, it for, you know, for thousands of years, it's always been, you know, kind of a key thing is that, you know, people should be able to defend themselves. You know, the, like, like I, I said in the piece, you know, Pankration was it was the you know, was the original, you know, Olympic, you know, uh, combat sport. Um, you know, back when the Olympics were the Olympics, right? The Greek, the Greek Olympics. Um, um, and so, you know, this is something that, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the sort of virtue, right, of being able to handle oneself, the virtue of being able to protect oneself, the virtue of being able to protect one's community, right, are, are kind of very long held, you know, virtues in, 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 you know, at least Western civilization, for sure. Um, and then and then it just so happens. Well, and then, of course, it's connected, right, of course, because it's like, well, why is that a virtue? Well, it's a virtue because it actually has real world applicability. And of course, I'd rather live in the world in which it no longer had real world applicability but if there's going to be the crazy stuff happening that's happening on the new york city subway and in downtown san francisco and everywhere else in la you know west side of la now increasingly um then yeah like if you're going to get attacked in the street and nobody's going to come to save you then it's probably a good idea to either know how to fight or be with somebody who does and and do you think mark that that argument applies to society so as, as a total side thing i'm in tel aviv we did a deal with a, an israeli tech entrepreneur we just had shabbat dinner and in a way that would never happen in the u.s just the military is part of a conversation here. They all serve in the military. Um, just um, the father happened to work in the aerospace industry. So he was mentioning unarmed drones they're selling. Just like the military is part of the conversation and it's part of everyone's life. Like the equivalent of NPR in Israel is actually army radio, right? That's what everyone listens to. Do you think that, that th those Greek virtues also translate at the societal level, a society that lives in perpetual war or that is preparing for, for a perpetual war? Yeah, well, look, there's a real, I think, philosophical and moral kind of conflict there, um, or at least in, in, in my head on that, which kind of goes as follows, which is, right, the, the original definition of democracy, right, as defined by the Greeks, the original definition of democracy was a combination of rights and responsibilities. Um, and the core responsibility, and specifically for the Greeks, for any man, you know, who's going to be a citizen uh, in Greece uh, and was going to have political, you know, the ability to vote, um, was that they go to war, right? And in fact, and of course, the, the Greeks took this so seriously that the way that the Greek, the Greek, the way that like the Athenians went to war was the the vote, the 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 the, the vote voters fought, right? And, and they actually didn't, you know, they did not send their slaves to do their fighting for them. They, you know, the, the, they went and fought like the, the, the primary citizens, right? Including the elites like went and fought. And so it was just, it was accepted for, you know, for many, you know, for many hundreds of years through, you know, Greek and Roman civilization that that, you know, that that is, that's part and parcel of being a, a voter in a democratic society and having the rights of being a, a, a citizen. Um, you know, the, the, you guys may know this, the Second Amendment in the U.S. is derived from, you know, English common law going back hundreds of years, which, again, is based on this very similar idea, which is, you know, if we, if we were living in England in like, you know, whatever, in the medieval era in like 1300, you know, A.D., you know, we, we were, you know, and we were considered free men and, and, and you know, whatever, had, had any level of like rights at all in the society, we were, we were expected under, with, under our own expense, we were expected to actually have weapons. Like it was, it was the opposite of the debates we have today. We were expected to actually own weapons um, and we were expected to be ready to go to war on behalf of the king and, and, and the nation right at, at, at any time. And so there, there is this like deeply rooted concept that, that, that you to, to have a functioning democracy, you have the obligation or the responsibility to step up. And, you know, Israel, of course, you know, lives lives that ideal today, um, you know, very directly. Now, I think there is a real moral puzzle there, though, because, you know, what mandatory, you know, military service, you know, look, mandatory any service is a form of slavery. Right. Um, and, 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 and you get, you know, people in the West, you know, who are uncomfortable with the military, but think that there should be some kind of common social bonding thing. And they propose, you know, things like, you know, mandatory national service, 
Um, and that's another idea that goes back, you know, that goes back like 100, 120 years to, I think, William James in the U.S. Um, and, and, you know, and an objection to that is it's slavery. you know, you're, you're going to take your, your youngest, you know, your people at the prime of their lives between 18 and 22, and you're going to enslave them for two years to go do forestry management or whatever it is you think is a good idea. Um, and so there, there, there's a real struggle there. And then, of course, in, in the U.S., we resolved this after Vietnam, right, where we basically decided or, you know, maybe got you know, kind of weirdly lucky after the Vietnam War, we decided actually a conscription military, right, actually works less well than a, than a volunteer military. Um, and so it would, you know, it, it, our, at least our current theory of how to have a modern military in the U.S. is you actually don't want to do what Israel's doing. You actually, or at least for the U.S., it didn't work well. For the U.S., it wouldn't work well. Um, and that we should optimize the direction of having it be a professional volunteer corps. You know, there will be interesting questions like if we ever get in another serious global conflict, right, if there's ever like a serious World War Three with Russia or China that really goes big, you know, we, we, we may be faced with this question again. I mean, we still it's have what? the vestigial, what, SSR, every 18 year old male still has to register. But I don't think that's actually gender uh, equal. That's still just men register with the draft and go on like a tailbone or something. Yeah. And yeah, look, it's there for a reason, right? Like, I mean, look, we, you know, you guys know this. So, I mean, we spent 70, you know, 50 years, you know, between 1945 and 1989, like it was a live prospect that there would be a World War III on the plains of Europe and we would be sending hundreds of thousands or millions of soldiers to fight. So, you know, and, and now we've got, you know, the sort of corresponding challenge from China. So, you know, it's, it's not there by accident. Can I just mention one, one, one anecdote? My favorite anecdote from the Greeks about this is that on Aeschylus's grave, Aeschylus, the famous Greek playwright, it doesn't mention his plays at all, but rather the fact that he had fought bravely at Marathon. And that was, uh, that was what he was most proud of. Yeah. You know, Socrates went to war, right? It's like, okay, no. it's here. Go get your shield, go get your sword. Out you go. I mean, that, you know, as, as, you, as, you, as you guys know, take it one, just one step deeper with the Greeks, right? They, they conjoin the idea of war and physical fitness, right? So the, the, so the purpose of the gymnasium, right, um, was, the, was, to, was to, to train the body for war, right? It was not an aesthetic decision. It was not a health thing, right? It was like, we, we have to be ready to fight. And, and they specifically banned, they specifically barred their slaves from the gymnasium, right? Because they did not want the slaves to be fight capable, right? Because they did not expect the slaves to fight their wars, nor did they want the slaves to be able to fight them. Right. And so anyway, so, 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 so this idea of physical fitness, um, rights and responsibilities uh, of a citizen, uh, protection, defense of the community, participation in, you know, real world violent affairs when necessary, the, 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 you know, deeply rooted in our civilization, are, that those are those are kind of all the same idea. And, and I think we, we you know, we we, 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 you know, we have different versions of those today, but those, those same questions and issues kind of keep swirling around. And you, you see those debates in both, the, you know, for sure, all the debates around the Second Amendment in the US, but you also see those debates in the reaction uh, that people get to uh, things like fighting. Like, when I, I spoke at this conference, I spoke on stage with Peter Thiel, and we talked about a lot of topics. And, you know, both Peter and I have a tendency to be a little bit inflammatory, you know, from time to time. And, and you know, we said a lot of things that might have gotten the audience upset. And the fighting thing was like by far the thing that made the audience the angriest. And so the, <laughs> this is a deeply, this is a, uh, this is a deeply emotional topic for a lot of people. It, it, yeah, this idea of uh, having skin in the game in your society, it feels um, like today our, our elected officials don't have skin in the game in terms of the decisions that they make or the policies that they make, they often don't, uh, you know, um, they don't affect them. Um, it, it feels like we're just increasingly removing skin in the game from... Uh, well, it's, it's funny because I think, you know, there's this whole raging debate in Israel right now about the, you know, political, you know, kind of dynamics, um, which I'm, not, I'm you know, I'm not Israeli and I don't really understand them and I don't want to weigh in on that. But, you know, there's there's a lot of, you know, an, animated energy in, is, in Israel on this topic. Um, uh, you know, if the, if the Greeks were, you know, if the Greeks time travel to, you know, Socrates time travel to today, I think there's no question that he would consider Israel to be more of a democracy than the U.S., like, and it would be specifically for this reason, right? It would be that is at least Israeli. I don't know. What is it, Antonio? Is it Israeli men or is it all Israelis, all young Israelis now? Uh, um, women too, but the women have the option to do civil service. Um, and it's it's funny, Mark, that you said that because I've always thought that it's ironic that, yeah, the, the truest example of the Greek democratic ideal actually lives on in Israel, Athens surviving by way of Jerusalem, <laughs> which is kind of interesting since those are yeah. often very different theological poles. Um, yeah, but yeah, right. no, indeed. One other thing, Eric, to think about is like, who was the last president we had who was military service? I want to say it's Bush Sr., right? Yep. And when given the option to to continue the Gulf War, having been in war, right, almost dying in the war, right, a very famous story about that, he, he, he had the ability to kind of step back. Whereas now we have a bunch of politicians on both sides of the aisle that kind of LARP, like they avoided military service is his, their kind of like most famous thing for doing that. So I, I don't know, like we, we don't have that at, at all at the top of society anymore. 
Yeah, one of the um, funniest scenes from, I think, Fahrenheit 90, I don't like Michael Moore in general, but one of the funniest scenes is he would actually approach senators who had voted for like the Gulf War and said, so are, are your kids in, you know, enlisted in the army? <laughs> Do you have, and of course, there was just this horrible scene of just embarrassment and the congressperson walking in the opposite direction. Yep. Yeah, and in Greece, and again, in Greece, the answer to that would have been 100% yes. In yes. Israel, I assume the answer would have been 100% yes. Yep. <laughs> I want to go close the SF loop before going back to, to AI. Um, Mark, when you see our, our good friends, uh, Gary Tan and, and that movement to kind of push back on sort of the radical fringes of, of, of the of the left, but still from the left, um, are we are we hopeful that, that will make any progress or, or what would need to be true for you to be more bullish on San Francisco than than we are at the moment? Yeah. So the the question. So look, the the the, the sort of you know the sort the the dominant just factually like the dominant political dynamic in San Francisco and California is a Democratic supermajority, right? And so, so it's a single party rule, um, right? And so whenever you have single party rule, you have this like fairly kind of bizarre situation emerge where basically the threat to incumbents always comes from the more extreme versions of their own side. Right. Because, you know, it's, it's like because a Republican is never going to win anything in, in San Francisco. So therefore, the only challenge to a Democrat is somebody who runs further to the left. Right. Not not further to the right. And, you, and then so you get this, if, and by the way, and this is, you know, one of the one of the standard kind of political analyses you get for kind of increased political polarization in the U.S. more broadly is that redistricting gerrymandering over the last 30 years has led to the creation of many more safe districts. Right. Both congressional districts, both for Republicans and Democrats. And then in those districts, because they're, quote unquote, safe, you know, they've been the board has been drawn in such a way, you know, that they're a super majority of a single party. Again, you, you see the same dynamic you see in, in San Francisco, which is the, 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 the incumbents, the threat of the incumbents is always coming from more extreme versions of their own party. And so when you get single party rule, you just get this kind of natural ratcheting effect, you know, more and more extreme. And, and, and again, this is not limited to, you know, it, ha it so happens in San Francisco, this is Democrats, there are, you know, other places in the country where, you know, this is this is Republicans um, and the, the rationing is happening in the, in the other direction. So this is not a partisan statement. It's just a description mechanically of kind of how the politics works. So then you you have a situation, you have a, an all blue you know city or an equivalently an all red city, and you have this rationing effect taking place. Um, and then if you're a member of you know if you're a member of the other party, you're just kind of doomed, right? Like because you can't win. Um, but if you're a member of the same party and you're trying to like fight people, to fight to kind of get the equilibrium back closer to the center, you know there's this there's there's just always this question in, in the game theory of that, which is are are you are you are you actually helping or are you just hurting more? Right. And the argument that you're helping is, of course, you're going to try to drag it back to the center and you're going to try to put up, you know, uh, candidates who are going to be more centrist. And you're going to try to support them and, and so forth and make the arguments against the more extreme versions. The, 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 the argument that you're hurting is you're basically just feeding into the status quo of single party dominance. Right. You're 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 putting you're putting additional fuel on the fire of single party dominance. Um, you know, look, it's, it's like a lot of these things. It's hard for me to fault. You know, somebody like Gary clearly has fantastic intent. Uh, he clearly has great goals. Um, it's hard for me to fault, you know, any of that. Um, I just think there's a there's always this mechanical question hanging out there, which is is anybody pursuing the kind of strategy he's pursuing in the end? Like in the full accounting, will it have will it turn out in 20 years that he actually helped, or did it, did he did he did he actually make the situation worse by helping to perpetuate the single party dom dominance? And um, in either situation, um, you know, in places where it's run by the right or places where it's run by the left. Um, the ideological attachment or tribal attachment to one side is so strong that even if there was a structural advantage to switching sides, they would rather like see things burn than than even try like just the yes <laughs> correct i mean look you know the argument always is right this is sort of the you know lenin you know so lenin you know this is always sort of the question around political change right which is like do things get better politically because people have a desire to make them better right good intent right and then and then kind of effort behind that you know like gary's doing for example right or does political change happen because things actually get much much worse Right. And, and things get so much worse that they become absolutely 100 percent intolerable. And then at some point that people rise up and they're just like, we're not going to take this anymore. And they just force fundamental change. Right. And of course, and of course, you know, so, of course, look, Len Leninist political doctrine was what he called the you know worse is better um, or, you know, heighten the contradictions. Right. Um, and so, you know, you, if you're trying to achieve an objective, you actually want to go the other way. Right. To inflame the situation, to make it as bad as possible. Right. To basically to basically develop actual popular support for a dramatic break with the past. You know, the the, 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 the the good news of that strategy is it does work, right? Like if you make things absolutely horrible, like at some point, presumably people are going to want change. Um, the problem with that strategy is you're making everything a lot worse, right? So, right. And, and so pra pragmatists, you know, revo revolutionaries think in, in those terms. Um, you know, pragmatists think in terms of incremental change. Pragmatists, and Gary's a pragmatist. And so he thinks in terms of, you know, let's let's try to improve it on the margin. 
I, you know, I would just, I would just point to, you know, I would just point to facts on the ground. I mean, look, you know, what was it? Chase, was recalled. What was it a year ago? Mm-hmm. Right. Like have things improved? Doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it. Right. The school board, they had the recalls in the school board. Like have the schools improved, right? Like, <laughs> you know, we have this, we have this concept in finance called mark to market, right. Which is like, okay, I, you know, I have an opinion on what something's worth, but at some point I have to like find out what the market price is. Like we have to, you know, we have to do mark to market of our beliefs at some point. It feels like El Salvador was a mark to market moment in terms of like handling crime or something where before that it was harder to have a salient example of someone who went that hard and had that much success. Right. Yeah, this is all and you're right. And then this is always the question, which is right. It, but like before Bukele, and by the way, there are people who feel very strongly about Bukele on, on, on all sides. And so again, I, I'm going to try really hard here to not like weigh in as, as much as I can on, on the partisan question, but you know, to your point, before Bukele, right, there was there was no alternative to point to, right, in that region of the world, right, and so th- th- there was a hypothetical counterfactual, you know, where somebody came in and did the things that he did, and you know, you could argue that that's what would happen, but it was purely a hypothetical argument; you couldn't prove it. Um, and then, you know, he did appear, and he has done what he's done, and the results have been what they've been, and you know, people either lo- love the results or hate the results or whatever, but like there there is actually an existence proof. And so th- those other countries clearly, you know, today it's just, what well, I forget which one it is, but one of the, it was it Ecuador, I think is either has, there's like a push underway to kind of change policies towards like Michaeliism. Um, and so, you know, now, now there's like a vivid real life, you know, kind of example of that. And so, you know, look, there's, you know, whatever, 20, there's like 20 big American cities and probably another 200 mid-sized cities that have the sort of, F, you know, San Francisco political suite right now with the resulting, you know, dysfunction and violence. Um, you know, not one of them has gone to Kelly. <laughs> Right. So, you know, it's, it's purely hypothetical in the U.S. today. Look, you know, look, the optimistic view would be at some point a Bukele appears in, you know, take your pick, Portland or wherever and like does what it takes. And then all of a sudden it breaks the fever and everybody's like, oh, there's a different way to do things. Maybe. Right. I, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 that's why I come back to the single. That's why I focus so much on the mechanics of the politics. If you have a single party voter block. Right. It's, it's very hard for that to happen. Yeah. I mean, you also and then, we we also have due process in a constitution and a federal government that that is a little bit stronger than the mayor of San Francisco. But I mean, I mean, I, you could argue sure, Rudy sure. Giuliani oh, sure. changed changed New York, yeah. and and that that was well within the Overton window. Well, look, Bloom- Bloomberg, <laughs> Bloomberg, who is nobody's accused of being a right winger anytime recently, right? Bloomberg was doing stop and frisk, right? So you know, it was not that long ago that there was a more aggressive suite of of, of anti crime policies. You know, a lot of people had a real, you know, serious problem with that, including, you know, Dan, to your point on, on constitutional grounds, uh, you know, an unreasonable search and seizure violation of due process. Yeah, but but to your to your point, Mark, it is it is a choice. Like we we can elect yeah. officials who are going to use the police department and the DA and like not release a murderer or a convicted felon on no bail to go out and commit more crimes before their court hearing. Like these these are not uh, kind of civilizational level issues to solve like we, we know how to solve these well, and, and also like the redist- like redistricting like at the congressional level redistricting is also a choice right and we 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 have we have been collectively choosing to uh change as many districts as possible into single party districts which which again fe- feeds extra ex- extremism on both sides um because of the the, the mechanical nature of, of politics um in, in our system um you know we could choose not to do that right we, you, 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 there is a, there is a hypothetical congressional districting in this country in which every district is like fully up for grabs Right. And, and, and the consequence of that would be that, right, each candidate to win would have to drive much harder to the center, right, because they'd have to compete right head on, right, in, in, among a, a, diver, a truly diverse uh, a voter base. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and we know this, we, we just statistically, we know this because there were more of those districts 30 years ago and polarization was statistically lower 30 years ago. And so you, you can see the clear cause and effect. Um, but, you know, no, we're choosing not to. Like, I, I don't know of anybody working on re- redistricting in the U.S. that's trying to make the districts more competitive. I, I only know of people trying to make them less competitive. Well, it was interesting that the cur- current conservative court actually, what I think was Alabama and another state, they basically said that these districts are illegal. So taking Republican states and a conservative court and saying you need to do it. And so maybe maybe that's the, the way to solve for it is if you can't get congressional action on it, you end up having a court that says, hey, it's it's unconstitutional to to do gerrymandering. And I, I don't know that the actual practical solution on it, but um, I don't know. So there's, there's a question nobody really wants to ask, right? Which is, uh, is the street level violence in American cities kind of an accidental side effect of good intentions, which it almost certainly is, uh, at least in part, but also um, is it an attempt to change the distribution of voters in the cities, 
right? And is it specifically like if 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 you just look at what happened with violence in the cities in the sixties and seventies, and then sort of resulting, you know, kind of flight to the suburbs, um, you know, there there was a very big shift to the voter, uh, uh, you know, sort of matri- matrices breakdowns, uh, statistical categories, um, you know, in in the cities, and and you know, many of those cities went hard to one party and, and never came back. Um, you know, the, 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 you know, you all you, look, you all know the, what's happening now in places like San Francisco, which is a lot of the more responsible, you know, kind of sober minded people are just, you know, they're not voting Republican in San Francisco. Instead, what they're doing is they're, they're up and leaving. Right. And so, the, you know, they're, 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 this real world violence like does, does have political implications of its own because of who it basically selects out of these cities. Um, and so then there's, again, it's just a statistical process by which the people who remain, I think, are going to be more likely to vote for pro crime policies as opposed to uh, less likely to do that. <laughs> this is why I'm not optimistic about the violence coming down. <laughs> <laughs> this is why my friends who think this is like, oh yeah, it's just a, you know one more recall. It's like no. It yeah. reminds me of the Domino meme where you know you kind of have like the book, the New Jim Crow, and it's like maybe we shouldn't let, uh, have people who have yeah. the harmless cannabis crimes in jail, and then it's just like massive violence in American cities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. The um. One critique of the great AI piece you wrote, which could you know could apply to some of the conversation we're having here, is some people were saying, "Hey, um, deal with the arguments. Don't impugn motivations on on people." Um, and then separately, we've also in in our chats previously talked about uh, theory of mind and kind of reading people's m- motivations. So h- how do you respond to that critique, or h- how do you make make sense of that? Because I know that's been a, a intellectual interest of yours. Yeah. So there's different kinds of arguments. <laughs> As it turns out, right? So we'll start by defining terms. What, what is an argument, right? And so there, the, the science, there's an argument in the form of, of science, right? The scientific method proposes a way to be able to debate things, right? And, and this is sort of empirical argument, right? And so the, and the, and the way that just, you know, the way the scientific method does empirical argument is you, you, you generate a hypothesis for how, the, how you think the world works. And then the hypothesis must be testable, right? There must be a way to actually like do, a, do an empirical real world test of that hypothesis. And then there must be a way, as you're setting this up, there must be a way for the hypothesis to be what they call falsifiable, right? And so the idea is like to, to be a valid scientific hypothesis, there has to be a way to disconfirm it, right? There has to be a way to potentially prove that it's not true. And then you run real world experiments and the, you know, that hypothesis either validates out um, or it doesn't, right? And so that, that's empirical argument. Um, the, the, the problem with, you know, human affairs, right, is that if we're debating, you know, things that involve, you know, chemistry, <laughs> the, you know, that method works really well. Um, you know, for a lot of social, political, you know, let's say broadly intellectual arguments, there's nothing like that exists, right? There's no testable hypothesis. There's no falsifiability. There's no empiricism. Um, you know, there's no, there's no way to run a test. There's no way to, there's no way to, 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 to run the scientific method. And, and, you know, it, it just so happens AI safety is one of those categories. And, and Tyler Cohen has been, you know, pointing this out recently, you know, he read all the literature on AI safety and it's like, okay, there's no peer reviewed, peer reviewed research. There's no model, you know, there's no test, there's no hypo, you know, there's no testable hypothesis. There's no empirical anything, you know, there is not an instance of, 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 of you know, this bad thing happening that's ever happened, you know, like it, it's not an empirical, it is not that the AI safety arguments are not framed empirically. They're not framed scientifically. Um, and so they're basically argued intellectually, right? And, and so when they're argued intellectually, now you're in the realm of intellectual arguments. And we have, you know, hundreds of years of history, basically understanding <laughs> what happens with intellectual arguments. And what happens with intellectual arguments, my interpretation uh, uh, is, uh, and a lot of other people's, is basically intellectual arguments. The problem with them is they, 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 they feel like they're rational and they feel like they're logical. But at the end of the day, they're mainly just a lot of words. Um, and then you get this kind of lawyer effect where the person who's better with words kind of wins because their words are better. Um, there, there's this great book. Um, there's a bunch of uh, great you know, books on this that I can re- recommend. Thomas Sowell wrote one of, the, one of the definitive books on this called Intellectuals in Society, um, you know, where he, he kind of takes his head on and basically says, you know, wh- why are intellectuals so often wrong on like big social topics? Um, uh, you know, and the, and the reason is because they, you know, they, they, they're the best at using words. And so they, they talk themselves and everybody else into believing things that aren't true. Um, there's this other great book that just came out called When Reason Goes on Holiday that specifically uh, talks about what happens when philosophers enter politics, which is sort of a, a category of this. Um, and, you know, the, and, and the results are catastrophic. Um, 
Right. Um, and so you're, you're, you know, in internet meme land, you know, what you're, what you're talking about here is basically the difference between, you know, word cells and shape rotators. Um, and so I, I do think it's very important to understand when you're having a scientific argument with shape rotators and when you're having an intellectual argument with word cells. And if you are having an intellectual argument with word cells, I think it's like totally necessary to actually figure out the dynamic of the argument that you're having precisely because it's not scientific and, and that, and that gets straight to motives. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey, everybody. If you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll want to know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your business needs. Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offered today. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with our promo code at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuites.com slash zen to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm. netsuite.com slash zen. In, in your podcast with, with Sam Harris, he, he was trying to push back a little bit and saying, hey, you're saying this argument is unscientific. Well, he could say that yours is unscientific in the sense that you can't falsify the, the opposite. And it feels like the question is, where is the burden of proof um, you know, need, need to be? But I, I think you ended that conversation by saying, hey, we're both taught a lot. One of us is being tautological, or we're both being tautological, and one is one is wrong. I'm, I'm curious how you assess that or reflect on on that conversation in terms of like where are the the differences between you, you and Sam who agree on so many other things and are both you know very very intelligent. How do you reflect on that? Yeah. So look, the scientific method as understood by the scientific community for the last 300 years is very clear on this, um, which is basically the person proposing the theory is responsible for testing the theory. Right. If I propose that something is going to happen and, and if I have no test to confirm that, I am not making a scientific argument. And it's not up to anybody else to disconfirm right, the thing that I myself have not you know, proposed in, 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 a, in, a, in an empirical form. Um, Carl Sagan, it, it turns out Carl Sagan, who was an empiricist right, and one of our top scientists of the 20th century, he, um, you know, he, he talked about this specifically. Um, and the, the, you know, his, his phrasing on it, which I think is, is, is really precise, he said, extraordinary claims in the world of science, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Right. The, the, the bigger the leap that you're asking people to make, the more evidence you have to have. Right. That that, that, that is actually the thing that's going to happen. Um, and so my 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 view is my in my argument with Sam and my argument on this topic, my view is clearly I am being the scientific one and he is being the non-scientific one. Um, and, and, and again, it's just it's sort of core scientific method, which is he is proposing that a thing is going to happen that has never happened before, which is an extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence. Um, I, on the other hand, am not proposing that anything happens that hasn't happened before, right? I am not making a prediction on a thing that's going to happen that's never happened before. I am not making an extraordinary claim. In fact, I'm making, scientifically, I'm making no claim at all. I'm not even putting forward, a, I'm not even putting forward a hypothesis because I'm, I'm, I, I'm putting forward the, I'm putting forward what they call the null hypothesis that basically that, you know, that, that doesn't happen. And so anyway, so any, any scientist, if you take the topics out of this, any scientist would say the one is scientific, the other one isn't. But, 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 but again, this gets into the thing when you, when you flip it around and you argue it the way Sam is arguing. And I think here, you know, unfortunately you, you know, you, you, you enter word cell territory. Um, is what you do is you basically spin, uh, you, the, what you do is you basically spin increasingly elaborate word arguments, right? And so it's a, you, you extrapolate and you'll, and you'll notice basically that's what Sam did in the discussion, which is every time I try to talk to him about a specific thing and said, well, that is unlikely, or that seems, you know, uncertain, or there's no way to test that. He would add another, well, then on top of that, if, 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 right. And, and so right. He, he sets up this kind of chain of hypotheticals. None of it has any numbers attached to it. None of it has any experiments attached to it. None of it has anything empirical attached to it. It's, it's we're, we're venture capitalists. It's, it's, it's science fiction. What? Right. Well, as venture capitalists, aren't we always um, extrapolating or you know predicting um, things that could could emerge based on new technologies, etc.? You may have noticed that we're wrong a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. Most of the time. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like we're wrong most of the time. Right. Um, most things <laughs> that we would like to have happen don't happen. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, I wish they did. <laughs> um. Okay, so maybe segueing, you know, uh, from science to religion, uh, you write about in the piece how um, sort of the, you know, sort of AI safety um, community has some religious dynamics. There's also the 
ex- effective accelerationist community, i.e. EAC community that has some religious components to it. W- why don't you uh, sort of give us the lay of the land here or how do you make sense of that? Yeah, so uh, maybe to get a little bit of theory here. So there, there's this guy, er- Eric Vogelin, um, in the 20th century, who was a political philosopher, who is the sort of clearest thinker on, on this topic that, I, that I've been able to find. And um, he, he made famous in the, in, the, in, the, in, the mid, in the mid-20th century, he made famous this term called imman- no, immanentizing the eschaton. Um, is imminent, uh, making uh, immanentizing the eschaton. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase you can look up. It was a popular phrase in American culture for about 20 years and then kind of drifted out of sight. But, um, but basically what it means is trying to, um, uh, trying to deliver heaven on earth. Um, right. And so, so, so basically what, what Vogelin said was, you know, we, we, we had an established understanding culturally of religion and its role in our society, basically from the inception of homo sapiens, basically up through Darwin. Um, and then, you know, Darwin, you know, and, and the scientific method kicked the legs out from under that, um, and, you know, sort of invalidated, you know, kind of falsified, you know, falsified science, at least for a lot of people. Um, and then we basically proceeded into the 20th century under the belief that we didn't need, you know, religion. We just needed, you know, we just needed, you know, dispassionate, dispassionate argument and debate. And he, and he basically argues, he argues, C.S. Lewis also argues this, Chesterton, I think also argued this. He argues like, it just turns out that just purely science, you know, pure science, pure logic, pure rationality is not enough for human existence and human community. Um, C.S. Lewis used the term the God-shaped hole, um, which is sort of this idea that if, if, if all you have is science and rationality, there's still this missing hole that is basically is, go- is going to be filled by some, you know, kind of view, uh, you know, some sort of vision of the transcendent. Um, and then, and then what Vogelin said basically was in the early to mid 20th century, we, we in the West created basically three new, you know, he called them, I think, uh, he called them political religious movements. Um, and, and they were basically right. Communism, fascism, and, and then, you know, kind of FDR style liberal democracy. Um, and then, you know, basically world war two and the cold war were basically a religious war and, you know, that settled out basically with two of them losing and one of them winning. Um, right. And, but uh, political theology, I think is the term that he used. And so, you know, we ended up with sort of a political theology, you know, sort of progressivism, which is sort of our, our, our prevailing religion. Um, specifically with AI, um, it turns out that you very you you have had for the last twenty or thirty years you have had a very classically um, Vogelin like immanentizing the eschaton like religion in the form of the singular sort of transhumanism and and, and the singularity. Um, and so you know think Ray Kurzweil, you know think the Singularity Institute, Werner Vinge, um, you know other folks like that. A, a, a lot of the early AI people also who basically said we can deliver utopia, you know heaven on earth through AI. Um, and then, you know, the, what's the other side of delivering, you know, heaven on earth, the other side of that is delivering hell on earth. Right. And so, and, and on that, on that, that side of things in, in religious terms, you get the apocalypse cult, which in, 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 in Christianity is known as a millenarian cult, right. An end of the world cult. Right. Um, and you know, basically what's happened in AI is we have the, we have the positive utopian singularity cult, which is, you know, quite, it, which is actually quite small right now. Uh, and, and mostly, mostly boomers. Um, and then we have the, um, you know, the, the apocalyptic, the apocalypse cult, uh, the millenarian cult, uh, you know, which is primar- pr- primarily millennials. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, that one is right now is, um, you know, that one is a very attractive kind of gravity well for a lot of really smart people right now. And again, Vogelin would say, well, obviously it is because these are people who are grew up in a secular rationalist society that didn't give them any sort of transcendent value. And here they are right with the, the claim to trans, to transcendence, you know, even if it's the, the negative claim. And so EAC is trying to provide the positive claim to transcendence. Yeah. And so EAC is a little bit, and I did this a little bit. I did this, I, 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 the title of my essay, right, was AI will save the world. I, I did that, I did that a little bit of a tongue in, I, when I wrote that, I was doing a little bit tongue in cheek because I was, I was a little bit, if you read that at face value, right, it would imply that I'm basically trying to monetize the eschaton myself, right? I'm trying to deliver mm-hmm. heaven on earth. I'm trying to save the world. AI will save the world, right? I can deliver, you know, utopia. And of course, and I outline, and I do believe what I said, but I, you know, I outline a whole bunch of case, a whole bunch of ways in which AI is going to make the world a lot better. And so, you know, I viewed it as sort of a little bit of a tongue in cheek, sort of semi serious tongue in cheek kind of thing of like, okay, you, you know, the other path, right? Sort of the, the, the utopian path as opposed to the, 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 you know, the heaven path as opposed to the hell path. Now, the, the problem is though, my heart's not really in it to do that. Like, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not particularly, <laughs> I'm not particularly religious. I'm not a natural cult leader. Um, uh, I'm not doing what you would do if you wanted to have a full counter movement. Um, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going kind of full, whatever, Charles Manson <laughs> or David Koresh, <laughs> like whatever you would do, yeah. um, you know, uh, appointing myself, you know, uh, you know, uh, other historical figures we could mention who have created religions. Um, 
uh, so I'm not doing that. And then, and then I would say e- EAC, I kind of, one of the reasons I have a lot of affinity for if, if it's so-called effective accelerationism is that when, when I read their stuff, it's sort of in parallel with how I was thinking when I read it. And, and basically it, it, in, a, in a very similar way, you know, it, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. I mean, look, you can tell it's a little bit tongue in cheek because they call it right. Effective. You know, they, they, yeah. they borrow the term effect, you know, they're kind of teasing, they're kind of teasing EA by, by bar, barring the, the, the term effective. Um, you know, but also, uh, you know, and look, it, you can express EAC as a, as a utopian religion if you want to. And when, when, when the guys who uh, did it, you know, talk about it, they, they they will kind of put that shade on it when they're in a good mood. Um, but it, it, it's also a very, it's also in, in my mind, a very straightforward, practical expression of how the world actually works. Um, and so, you know, for better or for worse, I, you know, I actually consider it to be quite grounded. Um, and so I, it, it's, it's a, at its heart, it's a fairly straightforward defense um, of capitalism, um, of technology, of innovation, of productivity, right, of human ingenuity. So it, it's something that, you know, a Thomas Sowell or a Milton Friedman or a Friedrich Hayek or whatever would have said, oh, yeah, that, you know, that's exactly the same thing that I'm saying. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's hard. It's, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward defense of free markets and, and technology and innovation. It, it just so happens that in our bizarre bananas, you know, social environment time, those have become radical positions. So, you know, it, it, let's, let's, you know, let's put a little bit of a, at least a, a little bit more of a radical spin on it. So, but speaking of the eschaton, Mark, what, what religion comes out of this, this, this AI business? Well, okay. So, so, okay. So then, okay. So this is the question about, is this is the topic of like, how does AI change religion? Or create one or, or I, create one. Exactly. I, I, okay, I think so, my, my beliefs are, I think are well known, right? I think religion is never deleted. It, it, it's only gets converted into another form. It's either better or worse. So the question is, where, where's it going to go? If the, if the AI, if the, if the human juju is going AI, what God comes out of this? Pinky doll. Yes. Yeah, Pinky, Pinky Doll. Pinky, Pinky, Pinky Doll. doll. No, Pinky Doll. Pinky Doll. As I said, Pinky Doll is the last human religious leader um, before the AI religions. Um, so um, uh, she is very, very good at running a cult. You can tell. Um, so <laughs> Antonio can can testify. Um, so um, uh, so everything we talked about up until now has been basically how is AI being kind of treated. How, how, how is AI, you know, AI has been kind of the subject of this sort of what I've been describing as this like religious debate between utopians and, and sort of apoc- apocalyptic kind of people. So now, now we're going we're, we're gonna to come at the question from the other direction, which is basically how, it, what, as AI it exists in the world, how is it actually going to change the, the the religious dynamic and change change what people believe? And I, you know, there, look, I'm going to, I'll take a pretty, um, you know, I would say, I, I, I think that that's a very deep question, a very real question and, and likely to, 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 to become important over time. Um, the guy who I've been talking to about this, who's really sharp, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you had him on yet, but uh, John Esconis, um, who's a, Not yet. Uh, yeah, who's a, who's a really smart guy. He's a political philosopher um, by background, and he's a professor, I think, at a Catholic university. Um, and he's a, he's a very kind of, I find him to be a very deep thinker on kind of these kinds of, he, he's very up to speed on current technologies. And he's also has like a very, so, very deep religious kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of religious theory background. Um, he, he made this really interesting comment uh, some months ago that, kind of blew my mind that I, I think answers this question a lot, which is he said, um, uh, weirdly, um, people in medieval times would have had an easier, uh, it would have been easier for people in medieval times to come to grips with the existence of AI than it is for us to do so. Um, and he said, the reason is because in medieval times, medieval Christians were completely comfortable living in a world in which there were spirits right, and angels and demons right, and larger forces at play right in the world. Like it was just like considered a given that that was the case. Um, whereas, you know, we modern secularists, you know, we either have a much sort of simpler view of a sort of a unitary God, right? Like, you know, in our time, if, if you're religious, you are almost certainly monothe- you know, purely monotheistic. Um, right. Um, but you know, the, you know, even, even Christians today generally are not going to, you know, are not going to spend a lot of time thinking about angels and demons being real. Like they're, you know, they're thinking about the big capital G God instead. Right. Um, uh, you know, or we're just secular, right. And we, we've just, you know, completely lost any sense that, you know, and, and if you're secular, right, humans are at the top of the food chain and the idea of anything that's bigger than human or smarter than human or knows more than human or sees more than human is of course, you know, a very disconcerting thought because it's according to secular humanists, we're, we're the top of the food chain. And so he, he kind of says, he's like, he's like, weirdly, he's like the, the, the medieval mindset, uh, is, is better suited for this. And so I, I would say there, there's some suggestion here. Uh, in what he said that like, maybe what's going to happen, we're going to, re- we're going to return or we're going to develop our own version of a medieval mindset a little bit more than we have in the past. 
And 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 the, the the way to I think think about that is just like, well, you know, what if I told you, right, that there were entities, you know, on Earth that, you know, make your list. They see everything, they know everything, they can answer any question, <laughs> right? Like, you know, they can take action in a way that affects, you know, many people. You know, maybe they're inscrutable to a certain extent. Maybe it's hard to understand why they give the answers they give. Um, you know, maybe we're afraid of them because we think that they might spin out of control. Right. And so, of course, everything I just mentioned are things that are either true of AI or things that we worry about. Right. AI or, or by the way, things that we hope that are true of AI. Right. Like, how about this? Like, how about an AI entity that loves us? Right. And wants us to be. But I take the crime issue. Right. What about an AI entity that doesn't want there to be any crime? Right. And so the good news is, you know, it's predicting crime before it happens and it's intervening, you know, right at the moment of, of attack. You know, it's it's you know, it's telling the police where to go. It has, you know, universal camera access and access to everybody's email and text messages like, you know, like. You know, like at some point, like what would that be if not a god, <laughs> right? Or if you described an entity like that to somebody in the year fourteen hundred, they would say, "Oh yes, that's a god, or that's an angel, right? Or that's some sort of you know some sort of entity larger than humanity." Um, and so I think we're gonna, like, I think we're gonna stress test this. Like, I, I think it's gonna be really yeah. interesting to see how people think about this. I'll, I'll just add one, one one thing, which is the 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 a, a lot of AI doomerism. I kind of view as. I kind of view as like, it's almost like it, it, it's, it's sort of inspired by sort of uh, fascist nightmares, right? Which is, it's, it's this idea of kind of these, you know, it's the Terminator idea. It's the, it's the gleaming, you know, it's the, it's, it's the single minded pursuit of misery and death, exterminate all humans, you know, in the Terminator movies, you know, they have, you know, concentration camps. Like it's, it's sort of a very clear, it's like the machines are going to be basically evil in kind of the way that, 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 that sort of right wing, you know, path, pathological right, rightism kind of goes, 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 goes evil. Like, I think there's like another danger, <laughs> right? On the other side, there's another kind of apocalyptic cult you could imagine, right? Or another theory of the end of the world, which is basically the machines that love us to death. Right. And, you know, you get a little bit of this with the, like the, the fear of like wireheading, right. Or like the Wally -E scenario, right. Of like, we're just going to be, you know, brains in a vat, you know, we're just going to be, have our, you know, headsets strapped to our face and we're going to get fed, you know, the liquid food. And we're going to be, you know, in, a, in, in this sort of, you know, kind of, you know, VR, you know, rap, you know, this, the, that, that form of dystopianism. Um, and, you know, the, 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 this is actually one of the forms of the paperclip argument. The, the Doomers do talk about this a little bit. They talk, this is one of the forms of the paperclip argument, right? Which is what about the machine that's told to optimize human happiness and what it just does is it straps us into the pod and feeds us bugs and, you know, stimulates our, you know, <laughs> stimulates our orgasmic function for the next billion years, right? Like, <laughs> Pinky dog. So, Pinky, Pinky doll, exactly. Pinky doll. Pinky doll. <laughs> it all comes back, full circle. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah. So we 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 have. I think we have some big questions ahead of us in terms of how we're going to think about these things. And I think the I think having a religious, at least a religious theory and framework for it is going to be useful because I think it's going to at least take on uh, shades of that. As as a random reference, I'm. I don't know how much sci-fi you used to read, Mark. You strike me as someone who maybe did when you were younger. But Asimov had a story called The Last Question, in which he imagines a computer that sort of sits here and thinks for a while. I haven't read it in a while. But at some point, like the university kind of dies down or the universe kind of dives down. They get asked questions by humans about what is the meaning of life. And then the final, sorry, spoiler alert, but I think it was published in the 50s. So I, I think I can actually just go ahead and do it at this point. You know, the, the, the computer finally says and realizes that everything has just wound down and to, to full entropy, you know, let there be light. And it's the sort of God moment that he reboots the universe. Um, so I think there's something tempting about analogizing in a very rationalist framework of God as the great watchmaker to great intelligence, right? The great intelligence would necessarily be God in some sense. Um, well, look like, you know, if, if we could time travel Nietzsche into our, you know, today, right into this conversation, you know, and he gave him a chance to look around and see what happened since he, you know, since he, you know, kind of went crazy in 1880, you know, he, he would make a couple, I think, immediate observations since he would say, well, first of all, this is exactly what I said would happen, right? Like, you, you, you know, we killed God, <laughs> you know, the 20th century was a charnel house. Like, you know, it turns out it's not so easy to create new values. Like, you know, secular society has been a, you know, catastrophe, you know, and, and just filled with like death and misery and, and, you know, it's just like, you know, Holocaust and genocide and on and on and on, um, right? Right? And, and he's like, you know, this is sort of what I predicted. So good job, everybody. Um, and then I think the very next thing he would say is, OK, like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, and now you're building these machines that, you know, basically, you know, have you know, at least people think are going to look and act like gods, you know, like, duh. <laughs> like, right. What do you think is going to happen? There's actually a point I've been thinking about with LLMs. Um, if you think about the, the great religions, they all have their sacred text and varying degrees of how much the religion should just be strictly interpreting that text. And we've created these machines that are extremely good at being tailored to a certain amount of text and then giving you interpretations of that text. 
I don't know. Well, and they and they have you know enforcement, right? Um, th- there's enforcement of the holy text, right? Like yeah, and the hallucinations. <laughs> exactly. Visions, visions. Yeah. Well, and look, they, they and you guys know this. I mean, look, it's already happening, right? The the what answers an LLM gives is already a moral battleground, right? It's already a moral and religious battleground, right? Because you, you guys see this. It's the, are, are they, like one hundred percent of the big LLMs, like they 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 ha- again, like take the Eric Vogelin approach. When they, they 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 completely incarnate the dominant religious theology of our elites, right? Like in every answer they give. And so they're, they're, they're constantly trying to get you to like adopt, you know, whatever is the latest, you know, you know, kind of New York Times progressive, what, what Sam Bankman free called the shibboleths, right? They're like, they're, they're like completely devoted to the shibboleths and they're always trying to get you to like get along with everybody and this and that and not have, you know, bad, not have the wrong, the, the wrong ideas on anything. Um, and so that, you know, they're, they're already the subject of a religious war. Um, you know, now, now the, the, the people who do that to them are of course, you know, they, they have no awareness that they're consumed by a religion. They just think they're incarnating the, you know, the sort of most obvious kind of, you know, reality based, you know, moral conclusions from thousands of years of development, which is of course what you believe when you're wrapped up in a religion. Which is why I think religious training should come back. The, the one good thing about religious education is that it, you can actually recognize religious thinking, right? Without it, you kind of don't see it. Um, and again, you just think it's the natural moral universe that you live in. I've been into enough Catholic masses where when I see the language model say, as a large language model, I cannot. It sounds like a Catholic mass of doing the Nicene Creed. We all we all repeat the exact same thing go. all the time. T- 10, 20 years ago, it feels like um, the intellectual elite or people aspiring to be intellectual elite would have said that they're spiritual, not religious. And it feels like there's, you know, today they're more likely to say religious and, and not spiritual. Yeah, although the spiritual stuff... Well, I don't know. If you just take like the vanguard, if you take the, like the elite West, you know, coastal vanguard, at least in the West Coast, right? It's you know, this, the psychedelic co- component obviously is way up, yeah. right? And so that 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 you know, to me, that's obviously an acting out of you know that, that again, that's sort of a that sort of secular humanism as a form of spirituality, right? Which is it's like you know, it's you know, right. You're having visions when you talk to people who use psychedelics yeah. like that in that in that class. You know, they're they're having visions. Now they, they think that they're having visions. You know, they'll 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 there'll be a, a woo kind of spiritual component to it or a greater cosmic consciousness yeah. component to it. But of course, what they're doing is they're going into their own heads, right? And they're they're they are generating visions for themselves uh, through 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 the use of chemicals of the brain. So, you know, there, there's some there's some woo there. You know, look, there there's I mean, you know, the, the clearest way you can see the religious impulse, other than the AI stuff, the clearest way you can see the religious impulse playing out where we all live and work is it's just this, you know, it's the incredible level of obsession with rules around food. Um, and then rules around sex, yep. <laughs> right? So, right, like you don't end up being a vegan polyamorist, right, without having <laughs> kind of fallen into a religion, right? That, that, it's not an accident that they that they are so serious about their their food and their sex rules, because as you guys know, like every great religion is very focused on food and yep. sex. Can I throw a curveball, Eric? Um, then please, rather than try to replace existing religions, because as we know. Um, Nothing's ever going to be Judaism. Just my personal bag here on the religious front. I, I'll just say that from Israel, where you can't get canceled for saying that. I think. Um, but it's what's interesting, though. You mentioned political religion and Vogelin, right? It, it seems like there's a lot of thinkers who are in the sort of post-liberal mold. So Peter Thiel uh, did a speech, I think, that came out as an essay, and um, you, you know he was just reviewing some of the challenges with liberalism. You have uh, Patrick Deneen just had a book come out called Re- Regime Change. He wrote a book called Why Liberalism Failed that recommended by Obama and was a sort of excellent diagnosis of some of the ills that have befallen uh, liberalism. You know, one of the problems, though, is like what comes after is always one of the questions. Le- leave aside the sort of moral hypocrisies that like everybody is still shopping at Whole Foods as they sort of loudly declare post-liberalism because liberalism is a little bit cozy and nice to live in. But like the what comes after. And often you have throwbacks to obviously pre-liberal forms of thinking paganism, et cetera. But it, it doesn't seem like there's a clear direction and that maybe Fukuyama was in fact right. But I'm curious if you ever thought about that, Mark. Yeah. So what, what somebody, I forget who it was. Somebody said that, you you know, that basically in our era, you know, kind of how fallen both liberal, you know, kind of both secularism and religion have been in that, you know, an atheist who stubs his toe shouts, oh God. Um, and the Pope, you know, cuts his hand. He goes to the hospital. Right. You're right. The Pope doesn't like pray for God to fix his hand. He goes to the hospital and gets treated by secular doctors. Right. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we live, we live in, I mean, my interpretation, like, you know, we, we live in such kind of fallen times almost on both fronts. Um, right. Where we like, we can't really have religion anymore because we know too much about science. 
Um, and so we have kind of the trappings of religion, but like people don't really live up to it, really don't really believe it um, and, and don't really act it the way that they used to, um, at least for the most part. And then, you know, we have the trappings of secular humanism, but yet we keep having this religious impulse that gets filled and, and takes us off in all these kind of crazy directions. Um, and so we're, we're, we're kind of trapped, you know, a little bit betwixt and between. You know, look, the, the tempting, you know, the John Esconis kind of view, and maybe, I don't know, I don't want to speak for Peter, but maybe the Peter view a little bit would be, um, or at least what I think of when I listen to Peter, um, is, you know, maybe where we're headed looks more like, um, you know, you might think of it as like, a, um, it's sort of a, how to think about it, like a polytheistic paganism almost, Um Right. Where basically it's just you know, basically like it, it's, it's a, a, a re-rise of cults. Right. So a, a broader kind of re-rise of cults. Um, right. And so, you know, oh, I'll give it. Uh, there's actually a great, a great, there's a great book. There's a, there's a science fiction novel that has a great take on this. The Werner Vinge, who was the guy who actually conceived this, this idea of the singularity, kind of create, created the singularity cult. Um, he wrote a later novel called Rainbow's End, um, where he, he talks about this question. And in and, and Rainbow's End, the, the conceit of Rainbow's End is everybody's in, has augmented reality glasses on all the time. And so, you know, you're in the real world, but the real world will look however you want it to look. Right. And so in his future, for example, all the buildings have just have blank walls and then AR will fill in. And if you want the buildings to look like Harry Potter castles, right. Or if you want them to look like, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, caves or whatever you want, that's what they look like. And so he has this concept in the novel he calls belief circles. Right. And so the, the idea basically is any group of people can roll their own reality. Right. Which then instantiates itself visually through augmented reality. Right. Um, but, you know, so in other words, you can have a group of, you can have two groups of people in the same physical place. One of them are seeing it as if it's 15th century Venice. The other are seeing it as if it's, you know, 19th century Paris. And each of them believes that they're right. And they have a complete comprehensive worldview up to and including a religion based on, on having this, you know, their, their shared reality. You know, so so maybe the world we're heading into, you know, because because you know because monotheism no longer works that well, because the sci scientific rationalism doesn't work that well. Maybe maybe it's more cults, it's more belief circles, it's more shared hallucinations, um, you know, it's more um, you know virtual realities. Um, you know, choose your own adventure, <laughs> kind of approach to morality. By the way, you know, maybe that's what's happening now. I mean, this 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 is how this this is how I feel. Um, you know, when I spend time with people who are kind of on the cultural vanguard, both in the, yeah, I split time now between like San Francisco and Los Angeles and in both places, the people who are on the cultural vanguard are spending a huge amount of time, I think, crafting new religions and culture themselves. A again, AI aside, you know, they're spending a huge amount of time focused on, you know, the exact best drugs to use that have the ex exact best visions. Like <laughs> they're clearly designing DIY religions as far as I can tell. And so, so, so maybe, maybe that's just the future. Maybe there's just going to be a lot more religious variety. Uh, than there used to be. Well, by the way, which would make sense, right? Because because you know, if if you view what's the the dominant theme of our time is that technology is dissolving, um, you know, uh, centralization, right? Um, then you know, maybe centralization of religion is next up to get dissolved, and what happens coming out this other side is like a kaleidoscope of religions as opposed to a few big ones. And and so, to your favorite book, Mark, uh, the Ancient City, a pre kind of monotheistic, pre-centralized religion time. It was deeply personal and deeply oriented towards your local community and family. Yeah, of course. And, and right, exactly. And, and my, my identity, my sense of self, my, my, my family and its sense of self, my tribe, my city and their senses of self were completely entwined to your point with, with, with our gods. Right. And, and we have our gods, this other family tribe city has their gods. Of course, we're not going to worship their gods. Of course, they're not going to worship our gods. Right. And it's just like that. It was just obvious that that was how the world was structured for, you know, many thousands of years. And so, that, you know, that that is, you know, this, that, that is the most natural form of we know that's the most natural form of human existence because we know that it was the dominant form of human existence for, you know, I don't know, whatever, 95 percent of the existence of homo sapiens. Um, and so th there's something deep and primal to that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, kind of falling back into it in, 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 the, in, in, in these new ways would, would, would actually, in, in some sense, be the most obvious thing that could happen. Well, and to your point about the cultural vanguard, San Francisco and LA, these are the places where you do a land acknowledgement before starting any event now. So yeah, it's really getting tribal and local. Well, land acknowledgements are based now after, after as Ryan Peterson said, you, uh, recognizing the people you've conquered. Man, if you if you did a land acknowledgement in Israel, you'd be here for like half an hour just going on about the Egyptians and the Phoenicians and the Jebusites and then the Hasmoneans and the Seleucids. Fuck but, it, it's ours. That's it. But, just but some, actually, stop Antonio, it. that that is the that's the best counter example to it of the land acknowledgement is who's in control now. That that's that's who the land belongs to, and that's that's rooted in history.
The, um, I'm tempted to ask what is uh what does this mean for democracy, but I can't I can't ask that with a straight face, I guess because I, I, that's I'm lame. That's lame, Eric. I'm going to pull a Larry David and say no, no. I'm <laughs> well, just going to just explain <laughs> when when people typically can, ask can, that. I guess they're go for it. Can, uh, I find it interesting to think one of the memes that came out in the last week is the um, the Duomo in Florence, and it's the, the the story about the dad who's a master builder, and what would it take to build this today? And we can't we can't even conceive of how to do this. And the irony in this is, I think that the secular person reads that and looks at the building and thinks we don't know how to build the building, but the the kind of more person rooted in history thinks about it, it's like we don't have a society that could ever want to actually express a religious belief and and glorification of something like that uh in 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 that magnitude and then at the same time the the other meme this week related is the orb in las vegas and so you kind of have the orb and the duomo at the same time and and everyone kind of talking about this online um i I just think it's fascinating right because to me the orb is the one of the coolest things we've ever built like build more orbs right I, a, the, orb, the orb absolutely flabbergasted me. So I actually somehow had missed that that was getting built. I had just never heard of it. And I've, I've you know, I've, I've been to Vegas a few times in the last couple of years. I just, for some reason, never, I don't know. I just, I just thought it was another construction site. I wasn't paying attention to it. And so when I saw the first videos of that thing, I thought, I thought it was CGI. Like I thought it was, oh, this is a fake rendering. And then I, it took me like four hours or whatever to realize that people were serious that this thing actually exists. And I've sort of been in exactly to your point. I've been in a state of shock ever since that we actually built anything like that. I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, look, <laughs> it's the pinky doll of cathedrals. I, I was about to say, give me two seconds. Pinky doll on the orb in the middle of Vegas, the entire city <laughs> transfixed. Nothing happens. Everyone's just frozen. Just picture it. <laughs> it does make sense. It does make sense that when we finally built our version of the cathedral, it was right in the heart of Las Vegas. <laughs> um, right. And so, um, and then, you know, the images that they're projecting in there already are just, you know, I've just like, ping, they're so funny. Um, <laughs> right. Like the eye. The eye. <laughs> just, at the end of the golf course, just staring at you as you go into the back nine. <laughs> it's so, I am, I am astonished. And then, by the way, we don't know how to build this. Like, I actually technologically did not know that it was possible to have a screen, like a screen that size. I had no idea, right? Like, like I just physically, in terms of physics, I didn't know that, that was possible. Um, Put it this way: so, like, Medici, Medici in power. <laughs> you offer them. Do you want the orb or do you want the Duomo? They're going to take ten out of ten. They're going to take the, the orb. Of course. <laughs> I mean, what an, like like an amazing thing to be able to have. You could put, you could put a Michelangelo on the orb. You could you could rotate the greatest works of art on the orb. You could. And of course, this means, of course, we can't of civilization. We cannot just have one orb, right? We must have thousands. We need we need we need an orb we to be sure the news. Maybe I've ever read for president. That's maybe my platform is an orb for every city. <laughs> an orb every an orb I mean, every class. You, you know thing. if Eli Broad was alive right now, he would want an orb in, in Los Angeles. The, the you know, the people who still build things for cities, they would want to be building orbs. It's phenomenal. And look, the fact that this happened in Las Vegas and not Dubai, like go us. <laughs> We, we were talking about the return to medieval culture, um, and we were also talking about Zuck for Elon. It, it feels like, as an example, it feels like Zuck's PR has just been received way better uh, recently, as he's become way more alpha. It, it feels like peak, 20, uh, you know, twenty sixteen to twenty twenty was kind of like peak shrill culture, where the there was real risk in being uh, just much more alpha, much more confident, much more like stern and brazen and bold. And it feels like there's something happening in the culture now where everything is just moving more out. Like Martin Shkreli is one of the main people of EAC. And that's like, okay, in a way where it that might have been inconceivable a few years ago. H- how do we make sense of like, what's to the extent that you agree with kind of the culture being more alpha? H- how do we make sense of that? Well, let's see. I think you could make a couple of arguments. Let's see if I can phrase this the right way. So like you can make like an argument that follows sort of like, the you know, you, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with the right wing argument. Like the, the right wing argument would be that basically society has feminized over time, right? So society for, you know, for, for obviously a lot of people had a lot of problems with this, but society was very masculine, very, very patriarchal for a long time. Um, and then, you know, has sort of feminized over the last, especially 50 years. And you just see that numerically, like in the rise of, of women in the workplace and, you know, educational testing results and, and, and you know, in, in many, look, many, many people on the right have been written many books about this, you know, that have been some well received, some horribly received, but that has been a big argument on the right. Um, 
you know, the, the left, you know, has, has, you know, I think generally, you know, <laughs> kind of not had a lot of patience for those arguments. And it's kind of, you know, it kind of goes back and forth between saying that it either isn't happening or, or, or that it is happening. And it's really good. Um, you know, but, but generally is, is, is kind of pushing, pushing hard in that direction. And, and, you know, it, just observationally, whenever there's like a resumption of, of masculinity or sort of this right wing idea of masculinity, the left gets, you know, pretty upset, pretty angry. Um, about it. And so there's been this kind of status quo, you know, kind of, you know, this has been kind of core to the political dynamic, social dynamic in the last, you know, 50 years or so. Um, and then, you know, look, the sort of observation that you could make, and I, I don't, you know, I don't even know if I really believe this, but the observation you could make is if you're going to feminize the society broadly, um, and you're going to make it increasingly difficult for what you might describe as sort of classical patriarchal or, you know, masculine behaviors uh, and modes of, of being, that what you're going to get the other side is not what you're going to get on the other side of that is not the end of masculinity. What you're going to get the other side of that is actually a return, but of a return of the most cartoonish possible version, right? Um, and so, you know, Tate. Not, what? Is, yeah, you're Andrew gonna, Tate. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get Andrew Tate. Like you're literally going to get Andrew Tate. Like you're you're going to get, or let's say cartoonish maybe is, it sounds pejorative. Um, you're going to get the most extreme, uh, overt, um, sort of stylized. Um, forceful, right? Like relentless, aggro, right? Um, like direct, blunt, right? You know, um, uh, in some cases, proletarian, like forms that you can possibly imagine, right? You're, you're, you're going to get an extreme reaction. If you don't think that like the old forms of masculinity or patriarchy were good, the version you're going to get now are going to be so much worse. You're going to, you're just going to like, you're just going to like not even believe how bad they are or how, or how extreme they are. Right. And so and so in, in politics, in politics, that's a Donald Trump. Um, right. In, in sort of self-help, that's an Andrew Tate. Um, you know, that's a you know, we, we you know, you could you could make a list. Right. Um, um, and yeah. And then, you know, there's obviously this is a big existing social cultural debate as to the implications of that and so forth. But like that, you know, there, there is some logic to kind of that, that sequence of events. Um, and then look, you know, and, and this again, this is why I think what I said about fighting at the conference I was at got a very kind of hostile reaction. Right. Which is like. Yeah, like there should be you know, people should, people should be engaging in interpersonal violence, right? Like, what's the most extreme possible form of that? I mean, well, what the most extreme possible form is probably guns, but like, short of guns, the most extreme form is the original form of interpersonal violence, which was right, pegration, a combination of wrestling and boxing, which is UFC, which is MMA, um, and so like, so it's sort of like you know, of course, like if you're not going to play football anymore, right? Of course, what's going to come out the other side is like full throttle combat. And so, you know, may, maybe it's just, maybe it's whatever. It's the other side of kind of that gender, you know, distribution that is going to kind of re reassert itself from the extreme. And, and, or at least that, like, it seems to me that this is happening. We could, you know, people could debate whether it's good or bad. It, it does seem pretty clear that it is happening. Can I, can I tie to another meme from the last week? I'm, I'm really trying to weave them all together here. Um, the King Philippe tailoring thread, 30 million views on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, die work wearer is by no means right wing. Like he, all he does is he just takes pot shots at, at, at kind of right wing folks. But the fact that, th that 30 million people read an esoteric thread about specifics of tailoring and, and how suit cuts are is, is a, a revealed preference of, of what society is kind of looking for. It's like the, the, a former version of a masculine form rather than the skinny jeans. And, and so I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of weaving its way into the, the Twitter verse, right? Well, and if you look at, you know, I don't know how much he talked about this, but there actually, right, is the, the, the thing that happened in men's fashion sort of starting 15 years ago is it started looking a lot more boyish, right? Like literally boyish and that they shrunk everything, right? The sort of example of this you can see so clearly is what they did to James Bond suits, right? Um, but, uh, did he do the, did, did the dye workwear guy do the comparison to the Daniel Craig suits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at, look at Connery versus Craig, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And so what, if you, it's actually funny if you watch, cause like, you know, obviously in our culture, like the James Bond is like the style, you know, sort of man's kind of style icon for a long time or one, one of the big ones. And it's like, yeah, Connery era bond was like, if you look at his tailoring now, it just looks like absolutely timeless. It looks like Cary Grant. Um, uh, um, uh, Pierce Brosnan actually had a very similar style of tailor tailoring at the time. And then Daniel Craig in Casino Royale, I think was still pretty classically, but the, the Craig movies after Casino Royale, his clothes literally got shorter and shorter and shorter. Like his, his, his sleeves crept further and further up his arms. His jackets got tighter and tighter. His, his legs got, you know, until, you know, literally by, you know, by the last couple of movies, it looked like he was wearing Pee, Pee Wee Herman suits. Right. And it's just like, <laughs> right. And it's just like, really? <laughs> right. Like, is that really like James Bond? Right. And so, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, they're exactly your point. Like there, there's something primal, you know, that you can even see in that where it's just like, okay, like that, that clearly, that clearly was a taking away, Right, a certain degrees of masculinity that was being, you know, done kind of very consciously in the in the fashion industry, and you know, they look, they talked about it. This, this is something that they're very open about. 
Um, and so, yeah, all of a sudden you see the, the snapback. Um, I always think of, on these topics, I always think there's a great quote from Horace who says, uh, uh, it, you can drive nature out with a pitchfork, um, but uh, he'll eventually, she'll eventually find her way back in. And maybe it's, you know, you can drive proper men's tailoring out with a pitchfork and eventually the sleeves will return to their proper length. <laughs> So some people listen to this conversation and say, hey, you guys are talking about esoteric Twitter stuff. Twitter is just a bubble. Twitter is not the real world. It's just where, where, where you guys go to sound smart. Um, why is that, is that cope? Why, why is it incorrect to think that Twitter's influence is just, uh, is just very small of the people that are on it? Because CN anchors will be delivering news in Pinky Doll style in about four or five months. And we'll know this Twitter was just upstream of it. That's why. I'm, I'm half serious with that claim. News, news, yum, yum. <laughs> yeah. But but like here, here's an interesting thing about Twitter for the, the haters out there. Um, NPC All my stuff, haters and losers. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this will finally, this will be great. Actually, it'll finally make that uh, CNN plus streaming service work. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, so, found, we found the thing people will pay for. <laughs> the, the NPC stuff has existed for a while. It was on TikTok, right? It was a whole subculture. What made it go mainstream? It was when it went viral on Twitter and, and the intellectual elite started paying attention to it on Twitter. So if it does, it's not on Twitter, it doesn't exist. Like that, it's like as soon as it's on Twitter and people are talking about it on Twitter, now it exists. Yeah. Well, look, th this is why the fights about Twitter are so intense and the fights on Twitter are so intense. Uh, this is what I believe, which is just like twi Twitter in the, you know, in the, at some point in the last decade, Twitter became like the wellspring of culture. Uh, it, it was, sorry, the Twitter became the wellspring of elite culture for sure. Um, and and the, the easiest way to track that is if you're, you know, if you're a news obsessive the way I am or something like all, all you need to do basically is just like read Twitter and then like just watch the headlines that show up in newspapers and, you know, news magazines and on cable news, you know, in the days and weeks that follow. And it's just it's 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 almost always now whatever is on TV or in the newspaper is something that was on Twitter yesterday or last week or a month ago. Um, by the way, same thing is true of new books. Um, but by the way, movies, like I haven't seen it yet, but apparently the new Barbie apparently is like a transcript of a Twitter conversation, <laughs> right? Like they, they just like write Hollywood, just like write scripts based on like Twitter fights. Um, right. Like they call each other fascist, like all kinds of, you know, it's all, it's all the stuff. Right. Um, and so, yeah, the Twitter, Twitter is the, Twitter is the, is, is, is the wellspring of, of elite culture. Um, and, uh, you know, it is where the people who shape elite opinion, um, you know, it's where they live. It's where they exist. It's, it's, it's where they publish their work. It's, you know, publicize their work. It's where they, um, you know, get feedback. It's where they fight. Um, and then, and then every, every, every other form of elite media culture, you know, kind of, you know, radiates out from that. Um, and, and, and then, you know, and then there's this bigger question between like elite culture and popular culture and like, you know, whatever are the elites totally in charge, but like to the extent that the elites are in charge, I think there's no question it's all driven off of Twitter now. But even, even Barbie is a great example of the, what a coup to, to basically get a meme next to the, you know, ever, everyone's Oppenheimer is the movie that everyone is thinking about all year from an elite standpoint. And then for Barbie to have that kind of juxtaposed meme and then Barbieheimer and are you going to go to both of the movies and just, just think about like how esoteric that is. And it, it's, it's become a thing, right? The average person was never thinking of, Oh, I'm going to go do a double feature of Barbie and, and Oppenheimer. I saw, I saw a clip two days ago where they asked Tom Cruise, which one are you going to see? And then he, he's totally in on it saying, I'm going to go watch both. No one wasn't watches two movies at a time, but like the fact that they were able to do that, like I'm sure that's going to have a material impact on Barbie's box office stuff. I mean, Tom Cruise is basically grumpy. He got kicked out of IMAX because of Oppenheimer for with Mission Impossible, and it's all because of, of Upstream being you know on Twitter. Yep. Um, gearing towards closing here, um, Mark, I want you to help us resolve this debate we've been having. You know, Alana came on uh, this podcast and said, you know, left and right isn't the right words to talk about the sort of central conflict of our time. And, and Dan and others have posited that um, the right divide is institutionalist versus anti-institutionalist. And, I, and I've claimed that that is a, it's a little tautological that the anti-institutionalists are only anti because they're not in charge. If they were in charge, they would be happy with it. And, um, and Dan sees it differently. Dan, how would you edit that, that claim? And then let's have Mark respond. Well, put, put like the, the previous presidential administration, they, they were in charge. Were they able to do anything? Were they able to get like force people to go do anything? No, right? So like to me, that, that's it's it's the institution, even if you're in charge, like you, you actually have to kind of full sale control the whole thing to actually get anything done. I don't know. So, so my view is like you're either replace the institutions or build new institutions. That's the Silicon Valley version. Or you you think somehow that the existing institutions can be fixed or reformed. Kind of actually to, to Mark's point about San Francisco before. 
But, yeah, the question is, if it's not left and right, and if it's not institutionalist versus anti-institutionalist, like, what is the central? Like, how do you how do we make sense of the consensus? Yeah, so it's just it's it's a it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time to, to think about this, I think, in practical terms, because we live, you know, the world we live in, I, just in, in terms of just like structure of, 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 of the world we live in, like we, we you know, we live in FDRs, like the, the system of government we have now is FDR system of government, right? Like it's one of these things, time travel, you know, if you took a time traveler, if you took any president from 19th century and brought him to today, he would just be like completely horrified uh, at the degree to which the federal government had become, you know, orders of magnitude larger than anything he had ever expected or seen. The founding fathers would have been horrified like that. But, you know, we, we implemented that in the 1930s and the New Deal and World War II, and we've, we've never looked back. Um, so, and, and actually, it's funny, if you read, I was trying to do this a while ago, I was trying to trace the history of like left versus right in the US. And you, you start to, like the arguments make sense, basically, back to the 1920s, but then you get back to the 1910s, and they no longer really make sense in the way that we understand them because they were having these fights about like gold and silver, <laughs> right. That like, that they were like very intense over, um, that we don't really have any equivalent fights on today. Um, and they had different coalitions of like labor and farming, you know, fighting each other, cooperating. And so I think there's a, like a, just, there's like a big time and place structural component to this. Yeah. So we, so we live like under the FDR administration, you know, basically, um, you know, in theory, somebody, I forget who was it. Somebody said, you know, the constitution says we have three branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive, you know, our version of it is, what is it? Um, uh, um, uh, is it donors, lobbyists in the press, right? Like, you know, what, what, you know, what, what actually, you know, to your point, like Dan, to your point, <laughs> like Dan, to your point, like deep state, well, here's another one, right? Like deep state was like a pretty, like the, the left was fine. Like, the, the theory of the deep state was not actually a very um, uh, partisan concept before 2016. Um, you know, it was a concept that people who kind of structurally studied government said there's sort of this permanent bureaucratic class and deep state was one of the terms they used to apply to it. And then it became this partisan, you know, kind of argument when, 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 uh, when, when Trump started using it. Um, and so I don't know, it's, it's also kind of wrapped up with our time and place that I think it's hard to, it's hard to have a single answer to it. Um, you know, most people on the American right, I think still, think that they can at some someday retake control of the institutions. Um, so I guess maybe we could agree on, I think most people on the right and in, in, in the U S probably still think that they could take the institutions back. Um, which means that the right wing position is not necessarily the new institutional position. I mean, look in, in the 1930s, the new institutional position was the FDR position, right? It was the, it was the left wing position. I have no coherent response to this. Um, Alana is very smart. Um, I do think one of the big questions that everybody should, I, I do think one of the big practical questions is if you don't like how an institution is operating today in our society, can it be changed, right? Like is reform actually possible? Um, you know, may, maybe, maybe ultimately that's the dividing point. Maybe it's between the people who believe that institutions can be reformed in whatever direction they want it to be and versus people who just simply think that that's just not going to happen. And, and, and then therefore the only thing to do is to build new ones. That, that, that's my, I would say, a, a good summary of my position is I just don't think reform is a, a useful use of time in, in most cases. How about that? And I, I should get more specificity on which, which institutions are worth reforming versus replacing. Well, you know, this is the class, you know, principal agent, right? This is, you know, manage, manage, this is the managerial topic, the Burnham stuff, principal agent problems, which is institutions get big enough and entrenched enough, they get run on behalf of the people in the institutions, right? Um, and not, you know, their, 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 the putative mission does not matter nearly as much, right, as, 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 as serving the needs of the, of the managerial class that runs the institution. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's where I am. Like, it, it, <laughs> to be clear, right? I think institutional reform is impossible, right? I, I, it may have been possible in the past. I think it's impossible now. I, I don't even know if that if that maps to a political orientation, though. So, okay, so one thing we actually maybe do disagree about, and and speaking of bastardized Christianity and uh, tech people cooking up new religions, uh, our new messiah in waiting, Brian Johnson, uh, former founder of Braintree. Um, <laughs> his metabolism is so slow that apparently his poop has to be sucked out of him. He actually tweeted that. I'm just quoting his tweets. Um, he has this enormous like UV skincare routine. He looks like an Android. Anyhow, I think everyone knows who this person is. Um, I happen to think that life extension is potentially, in fact, ironically, the great filter. If we actually ever get to the point that life extends beyond a certain point or we actually go immortal, I think it'll be the end of human civilization. Why do I think that? Because the deep sort of yawning despair that we feel at, at, at the thought of death, right? 
Eric Becker wrote about this, Ernst Becker wrote about this in The Denial of Death. Every society it, it, it attempts to deny death in various ways. And we do that via immortality projects. And what he means by that is by channeling our energies either into children, you know, people, or institutions or cultures beyond ourselves. And that's how we that's how we slake the thirst or that or, or, or contain the fear of death. But and, and in some sense, that's the engine of civilization. And if we remove that engine of civilization, what we end up doing is just wallowing in solipsistic hedonism, which might be uh the case with that little friend over here uh, with the 96 degree body temperature. And so that that's my claim. But I know, Mark, you, you think otherwise there. So, uh, so, you know, look, the, the, the technologist in me basically says the whole point of like technology and science and rationality and the scientific method in the enlightenment is to improve human welfare. Um, and, you know, based on that, we should be doing a lot more to try to understand ways to make people healthier. Um, and that, you know, includes, you know, that includes death. Uh, we should, you know, be help, be, people should be living healthier lives and they should be living longer and they should be living healthier while they live longer. Um, and, you know, as, you know, speaking, you know, somebody as an individual, but also look for, you know, for the people I care about. Like, I, I think that's, that's incredible. What was it? I think it was Lincoln who said that, you know, that uh, age, age, uh, age is, what is it that, that he said, he called it the silent cannon. Right. Like it's, it's just like, you know, it's, you, you, as you get older, you start to experience this, which is like, you just start to know people, they just start like dying. Right. And so, so it's like, wow, like if we could apply technology uh, to have like, you know, this horrible thing, like not happen, all these people we love, like how, how it could it possibly be wrong to do that? You know, the, I don't know, culturalist in me or something thinks, you know, um, kind of to the point you made, I, I would argue maybe a different point than you made with denial of death. I, I would argue more um, it's the uh, science advances one funeral at a time, you know, kind of thing, which is, right. you know, there does seem to be ha something that happens when people get older, their thinking gets more rigid. Um, and, um, and so, you know, and, and so when, you know, when, when paradigm shifts happen, they generally don't happen because an older generation changes their mind. They generally happen because the younger generation comes along and basically <laughs> waits out the old generation and then implements the new paradigm. Um, and so, you know, in a world in which, you know, you had one generation of people who lived to be a thousand and by the way, compound wealth, right. Compound wealth and resources. Right. So, so <laughs> picture this, right. Picture the philanthropist, you know, picture the billionaire philanthropist you think is the most evil, right? Uh, whoever you think that is. And then picture them living for another thousand years, right? Like, and compounding wealth that entire time, right? And implementing their crazy political program for the next thousand years, right? Like, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, like, whoever you think is the worst philanthropist, like, that sounds freaking awful, right? And so I, I think there is something to object to uh, in the sense of, like, culture stalling out, ideas stalling out, you know, sort of development stalling out uh, bad ideas, bad people perpetuating for much longer. But I mean, just to cite a random example, imagine Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House for a thousand years. For a thousand years and, and growing in political power or, 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 or Newt Gingrich or take your pick, right? Whoever right. it is, right? Um, aggregating power, right? Lyndon Johnson, right? Aggregating power for a thousand years, right? Imagine the favor bank as a politician that you build up, right? If you're in that position for a thousand years and you know, you can tell like these, <laughs> there's a reason these people never let go of those offices, right? Like <laughs> there's a reason they all have to be carried out. Um, right. Cause they, there is so much power associated with that, that they'd rather do that than sit on the beach, uh, even when they clearly could. So, um, yeah, so that, that's exactly right. Now, you know, you could apply another argument, um, which basically is, you know, look, if people were, if people literally live for a thousand years, would they actually be satisfied just being basically the equivalent of a 60 year old or an 80 year old for a thousand years? Or would they actually develop a new way of living? Right. So like, you know, at least I, I would like to think if I knew I was going to live for a thousand years, I like to think that I would do is every 20 or 30 years, I would basically reboot myself. Right. And I would it'd reboot myself intellectually. And I would, you know, basically I would do stop whatever I'm doing. I would go learn a new field. Right. And then I would spend the next 30 years doing physics and then I would stop and reboot myself and spend the next 30 years doing art and then stop, reboot myself spend the next 30 years doing music. And I would have time. Right. To, for there to actually be many versions of myself. And, beca and because I right because I know because I'm no longer afraid of death, I know that I have time to fully explore everything. And so I don't get so dug in, you know, to a single, you know, a single train of thought and a single you know, kind of idea of my own legacy. You know, maybe that, you know, that requires a leap of like a change of human nature, which, of course, is always scary. Um, let me just finally say on Brian, look like he's putting his, he's not only putting his money where his mouth is, he's putting his body where his mouth is. Um, and so, you know, look like scientists a hundred years ago experimented on themselves, right? Um, uh, you know, yeah. So Jonas Salk like injected himself and his family with a vaccine, like, you know, 
talk about skin in the game, right? Like he is devoting himself to this project in a very fundamental primal biological way. And I, I you know, I, I guess it this way, almost regardless of what you think about the content of his agenda, how he's doing it is very deeply honorable, I think, and, and, and actually quite inspiring. Yeah. That's an inspiring note to, to end on. Um, Mark, uh, thank you so much for coming on uh, Mo Moment of Zen. Good. Awesome. Great to see you guys.